there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. In the 21st century, when Homo Modenicus sets out to fill his stomach, he needs a shopping cart. But what he really needs is determination. The variety of choices in each aisle is infinite. A supermarket sells an average of 8,000 product references. Whether you're in China, the United States or Europe, the supermarkets are overflowing with standardized products that are designed to please the stomachs of the world. Of course, all these products have not been carefully prepared by the local caterer, but by a handful of food processing giants. These hugely competitive corporations that exercise their creativity by concocting all sorts of irresistible products. These giants alone supply 80% of what we eat, and none of us can escape them. Their grub is salty, fatty, sweet, whatever, but we love it. What makes up this miracle recipe that we are so addicted to? Here is Remy Bukel, who will be leading this investigation. Remy is Franco-American, who is a careful and educated consumer, and he loves to eat. Good morning. I'll have a parry breast, please, to eat straight away. Mm, that looks good. We will be travelling with Remy through Europe and the United States to try to get a clear understanding of how these industrial food giants have conquered our senses with their disgustingly good grub. Remy was raised on hamburgers and french fries in America, the country where you can eat 24-7. When he arrived in France, he fell in love with good food, local markets and home-cooked meals. For the past 25 years, he has watched the junk food of his childhood, burgers, soda and pizza, to mention a few, invade the tables of this old world. We all know the truth. It is bad for you to eat too much and to eat poorly. You can get sick or worse. Nearly three million people die each year from obesity-related health problems. We no longer eat what we need, we eat what we like. We stuff ourselves with bad food and go back for more. Why do we like it so much? In the beginning, it was for the taste. Our ancestors ate to survive. We, on the other hand, eat to satisfy our cravings. We no longer eat what we need, we eat what we like. If you want proof, just look at these Americans queuing up at this temple of sugar to admire candy artwork. Just like them, Remy loves sweets, ice cream and cookies. How did he fall into the cookie jar? Remy has chosen to start his investigation on Halloween, the great American sugar holiday. For the occasion, he has gone to see the person who helped educate his palate. So this is my mother. That evening, children dressed up as monsters, petitioned the neighbors for their share of candy. 
It takes Remy back to his own childhood and he is thrilled. You had an issue about us eating too much sugar. My job was to keep my children from being damaged by it and that this was serious stuff, so I tried my best. Some children grow up and believe the same thing and others don't. Uh, but what can I say? No, we're all sugar addicts now. Uh, <laughs> I probably would have been sugar addicts anyway. Parents can try their hardest to teach healthy food habits, but tough nuts like Remy will continue to swear by sweets and cream-filled cakes. This happens to be normal, it is completely natural to like sugar, but why? After Washington and its tidal wave of candy, Remy returns to France. He travels to Dijon, to the INRA, or the French National Institute of Agricultural Research. Hello. Hello. Remy Burke. Sophie Niklaus. Pleased to meet you. Welcome to the Science Centre for Food and Taste. OK, I'll follow you. Sophie Niklaus, a researcher at INRA, studies the origins of taste. According to her, certain preferences are very obvious right from birth. Here, for example, we are trying to measure their preferences for basic tastes. Salty, bitter, sweet and acidic. You can see evidence of clear preferences as early as three months. The most common example is the virtually innate attraction to sweetness, which incidentally happens to have strong pain-killing properties in children. Pediatricians often make use of this effect to calm children when vaccinating them. This strong preference for sugar exists from birth. It is natural in the sense that it indicates the presence of energy in foods. At a time when food options were not unlimited as they are today, it was essential to be able to pick out foods that would be the best sources of energy. A sweet taste was a strong indicator of this. It is natural for man to like sugar, but also fat and salt. Man detects the calories that are required for his survival. Taste differs from country to country. This accounts for specific food traditions. The French in their cheese, the Chinese in their chicken feet, and the British in their jelly for dessert. What we like to eat is no longer slowly simmered on the stove by our grandmothers, but by the food industry who manufactures and transforms 80% of what we ingest. All prepared and seasoned foods from mixed salads to meat and fish dishes, canned foods, pizzas, quiches, cakes, in the fresh, dry or frozen aisles, are all industrially produced. In the past 10 years, the number of industrially produced products has exploded. In France, the pre-prepared dishes in the fresh section have doubled in volume. There are 281 yogurt product references alone. With temptation in front of us 24-7, we eat more than we used to. In 50 years, our food bowl has gone from 2,200 calories to 3,000 calories today. So, how do you choose in this sea of products? Taste alone does not fill our shopping carts. Appearance, touch, smell, they all come into play. A battery of invisible tools are working on our senses and influencing our purchasing behavior. When we shop, our choices aren't dictated by taste only. The food industry has plenty of other tricks to influence our choices and make us buy more. We're about to meet with Pierre Chandon, who is a specialist in food marketing. He will help us decipher this. 
Here we are. In the Temple of Consumption. Hello. Let's go. I've come to see you because I'd like to understand more clearly how things work in a supermarket. How does the food industry push us to buy more and more, and what tricks are used on us consumers? It starts as soon as you enter the store. As consumers, we know about advertising. We know it is there to influence our choices. We also know that price is a factor. But for example, even the simple decision of whether to take a basket or a cart makes a difference. It is proven that if you opt for a basket and carry a close to your body like this, you'll be encouraged to make purchases for yourself, things that give you pleasure. I'm going to treat myself and grab that chocolate bar. On the other hand, if you go for a cart, you'll be pushing it in front of you. It becomes a sort of barrier. It helps us to resist temptation and motivates you to focus on fruits and vegetables. Today we're going to look at all the things in the store that influence our buying choices without us knowing. When I get to the refrigerated section and look at the yogurts, the desserts and all, the selection is huge. There's too much choice. I panic. It's just too much. There used to be no more than a few different yogurts on the shelf. Yes, absolutely. The explanation is simple. If you constantly eat plain yogurt, you will tire of it more quickly and therefore consume less. If you're offered a choice in terms of flavor, packaging, color, etc., you will consume more and you won't tire as easily. The manufacturer's goal is to come back each year with new flavors or some new packaging to maintain novelty and make us consume forever more. Here we have four yogurts or four opportunities to consume 125 grams of yogurt, which contain about 100 calories. Here we have this yogurt to drink which is consumed like one yogurt except that it contains 500 milliliters. That is equal to the four yogurts all together with about 500 calories. But this will probably be consumed in one shot. This is an example of being coerced into consuming more, going from four small 125 gram yogurts to this big 500 milliliter bottle. Not to mention this bottle which is supposed to be the family size packaging, although it is common to see teenagers drinking the whole thing down in a half hour as an afternoon snack. These are pre-prepared dishes? Here we have ready-made dishes right across from the fresh fruits and vegetables. It is intended to remind you that although you could peel and cook your own vegetables, you can also just reach out, grab a pre-prepared product and have the same meal right away at home. Right, ready to cook. All you do is pop it in the oven or microwave, it's done. The contrast with the fresh fruit and vegetables that need to be prepared. No one even knows how to cook these things anymore. The ready-made product is so much more practical, and this is the best place in the store to emphasize this, right here near the fresh food. Before that product gets put out on display, the special miracle recipe needs to be perfected. The one that will keep you coming back again and again. Back in the United States, Gail Vance Seville, the director of Sensory Spectrum, invites Remy into her laboratory of sensory analysis. This is where the fate of our food is decided. Before a product hits the market, everything is tested. Texture, acidity, flavor. Today, a strawberry yogurt is being put to the test of the lab technician's palates. Okay, sweet. Do I spit it out afterwards? We would always tell you to spit it out. Okay, how much of it is strawberry? Three? Mm -hmm. Three. Two and a half? Two and a half. Mm -hmm. The character of the strawberry is what? How much? Four. 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 You do this technicity, all, all your different programs are this technical, right? Or even more technical? Everything for descriptive analysis is taken as 
detailed as possible. Okay. So for flavor and texture, we would probably also do appearance, especially if it's being tested with consumers as well, mm -hmm. because they often react to the way things look way yeah. before they ever react to the way things taste. Nice. And do you do this like in your everyday lives? Do you <laughs> set aside yeah. tasting things and so right? You're often asked when someone like your husband or your you know whoever you're dining with knows what you do, and they'll say, "What is that weird thing in your food?" And you have to say, "Do you really want to know?" <laughs> Both appearance and texture seem to be essential ingredients in the miracle recipe. Mm. Let's take the best selling cookie Oreo, which is a sandwich cookie filled with cream. Oreo is sold in over 100 countries and generates $1.5 billion in turnover for its manufacturer, Kraft Food. However, research has shown that nutritional quality is not part of Oreo's makeup. The cookie contains complex sugars, fat, barely 7% coca, and whey powder instead of milk. But even when we know that, we still come back for more. Why? What's funny to me is, is Oreo cookies, which are one of my favorites. What makes me want to eat those things? What elements do you think that may make us really want to come back to a food? Why Did, is this so great? Yeah, why is it so great? Why is an Oreo cookie? Have an Oreo cookie. <laughs> but what makes this an interesting product is, going back to the texture experience, it's got flavor, interesting flavor combinations, but it has the contrast between the creamy center and then the crispy, crunchy outside. Mm -hmm. And so you're biting into the cookie, and unlike just having a plain sugar cookie where you have to do all the work to make it wet it right. down, the fat is there to help you wet it down. And then um, you're getting the vanilla sort of from the center and the chocolate from the outside coming together in the, in the flavor. And so it's a, it's a very nice combination of, um, of factors. So the, Art of this is to develop flavor combinations and texture combinations that work together so that you're not left with this um, aftertaste or afterfeel or residue of stuff in your mouth. So you have to have something that is palatable. So between See, the explain the word, explain the word palatable just before palatable you meaning that people will consume it and that it's actually edible and l well liked by people so that there are. Uh, craving it or, or really like looking for it. So let me take this back. These are mm. my cookies. You don't keep my cookies. No one is able to resist the products tested by this taste guru who leaves nothing up to chance. Even Remy fell into the trap. Every year, the food industry spends $3.5 billion on research carried out by labs like Sensory Spectrum. That would buy a whole lot of tap dancing lessons. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. On top of the taste, the texture, the color, and the shape of the packaging, isn't there some other little extra, some chemical formula, some invisible ingredient that could account for our compulsive attraction to these chips, pizza, and chocolate bars? Remy sets off for Yale University, where Kelly Brownell studies the impact of poor eating on our organism. Well, there was one, at one point in human history, if there had been food labels, they would have had one thing on them. It would have been whatever the food was. And now there are 50 different chemicals, lots of different sugars, colorings, flavorings, preservatives, and these things fool the brain. The, the human brain was never designed to handle this chemical onslaught. And so the, the foods have been stripped of things like fiber that might have given you some sense of how much you've had and make you feel 
full. And a lot of things have been added to them that maximize their sensory properties. And they explode in this burst of sensation with flavor, with smells, with colors, and you're entertained by the food in a lot of different ways. And that maximizes the sales of the company, but it also seems to maximize disease in many cases. Amongst these 50 different substances, there is one that stands out above all others, sugar. We have already seen that the consumer is naturally attracted to sugar, therefore industrials gladly add it to everything in its many forms. In the last 50 years, sugar has become the star of the kitchen. In the past 30 years, its worldwide consumption has tripled. Remember the saying, you are what you eat? But today I'm on my way to Le Mans to meet Angelique, the nutritionist. Her work is really interesting. This morning she's teaching people how to read a product label. Angelique Aubert, nutritionist in Le Mans, helps people understand and master the contents of their shopping carts. She even gives classes in label reading for those who are really lost. Take this savoury buckwheat crepe, for example. The label says the crepe contains water, buckwheat flour and salt. So far, so good. Then there is the bechamel sauce. That's where it starts to get complicated. Then wheat flour, vegetable fat in the form of coconut oil, which is a saturated fat. Then there's a wheat starch, modified potato starch, which is far from natural and is metabolized by the body, just like sugar. Then we have powdered milk, dehydrated butter powder and glucose syrup. What is glucose? Sugar. sugar. That's not good, is it? I've skipped the milk proteins, the spices and all the rest. Since we met, I've stopped eating sugar. That's very good. Is this something you eat? Let's look at the ingredients. That's what we're here for, right? Sugar. Do you put sugar in your vinaigrette? After the practice comes the theory. Let's summarize. Take a list of ingredients. The shorter it is, the better. Look for the presence of sugar in all of its forms, OK? Definitely eat less fat, less sugar, less salt. Please avoid sugar, and it's everywhere, in everything. Fat was singled out because it was thought that fat made people gain weight. It's not the only factor. You really must watch out for the sugar contained. I was just telling Remy that in 1830, we had five kilos of sugar per person per year. Five is not that much. And how much do we eat today? 18. 20. 50. 50. That is an average. In 2010, we consumed 50 kilos of sugar per person. This is why you must keep a watch out for sugar. Easier said than done. The food industry has taught us to like sugar from day one. Sugar is present in baby food from the earliest stages, from four months onwards. All children's yogurts, the pretty coloured ones with the cute pictures, contain sugar. All children's food, sugary breakfast cereals, contain lots of sugar. Happy children with satisfied taste buds will come back for more. When you overload on sugar from an early age, what are the consequences later on in life? Can processed foods lead to addiction? These sorts of questions are beginning to interest researchers around the world. Now we are back in America, where Amy is about to share a cookie with Ashley Gearhart, clinical psychologist at the University of Michigan. Get 
actually, I thought since we were talking ah. about addictions and chocolate <laughs> and, and sugar and fat, I thought we'd, we'd have a little bit of these. These are perfect examples <laughs> right there. She studies the relationship between food and addiction. I'm personally pretty addicted to chocolate, to sugar, and things like that. Yeah. And um, I'm, you know, this is, I wanted to talk about that. What yeah. is an addiction, a food addiction? So, um, for example, if you're going to take a coca leaf and you're going to sip it in a tea or chew it, mm. you know, it really has very little addictive potential. People don't really get addicted to that. But if you take it into a lab and you strip it down so it's much more potent and then you increase it so it really hits your blood and your brain really, really fast, you have cocaine and it becomes much more addictive. So if you think of what we've done with our food in the last couple decades, we've taken things like sugar and fat and salt that are already really rewarding and we've stripped them from their natural containers and we've increased the amounts there in foods like this. And so now these have such high amounts of sugar and fat and salt, more than our bodies have ever been able to kind of man manage before. Mm -hmm. And yes, they really kind of spike your spike your brain get it go really going when you have that first bite of chocolate have some chocolate ah uh, yes a little bit of chocolate see that one's got salt you see oh this one has so salt on it okay. yeah so that's like the perfect trifecta of the sugar and the fat and the salt if fat sugar and salt tickle our pleasure centers can we actually say that these substances behave like drugs In 2008, during the course of an experiment, a research team based in Bordeaux accidentally stumbled upon something unexpected. We were not initially interested in sugar. Our primary objective was to understand the neurobiology behind the cocaine addiction. In order to do this, we decided for the first time to offer the animals a choice between cocaine received intravenously, which are highly addictive means of intake, and a reward option that would be naturally ingested. And we chose a sugary beverage as the reward option. To our surprise, practically all the animals shied away from the cocaine in order to drink more and more sugar. So when man savors sugar, is it having a drug-like effect on him? Scientists at the University of Oregon have decided to find out using brain imagery. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Are you ready for it? Yeah, I'm right. Scared? Well, I'm a little scared, a little okay. apprehensive. Yeah, everyone is a little bit nervous <laughs> in the beginning, but... Remy is about to undergo an MRI while drinking a chocolate milkshake. It makes me kind of anxious and nervous the first time. So I'm going to place the manifold right now in front of your mouth, and I would like you to open your mouth right now. How is that for you? Yeah, you can embrace it right now. Yeah, fine. Okay. Positioning um, test here. Oh my god. Sonia Yoakum, MRI specialist, will be today's waitress. Yeah, only... All right, are you ready? Yeah. Just do your best. Okay, I'll do my best. All right, here we go. Okay. 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 After 45 minutes of testing, the zones of the brain that have been activated by sugar begin to appear on the screen. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's see what happens. I want to see if I'm a real addict here. <laughs> <laughs> so let's show the images where um, you actually received oh, wow. the, Im uh, like the milkshake. Am I lighting up? <laughs> uh, yes, you definitely light up. Um, there are some areas that we know that light up during when you receive uh, very palatable food, very mm -hmm. like tasty food. So here we definitely see caudate activation, right. big reward area. Um, you see, I was excited about it. Yeah, I, I yeah, enjoyed totally. that. It's I liked it a lot. It's rewarding. Yeah. So basically, you're saying I'm an addict, right? No, <laughs> not at all. No, I mean, I can compare your brain image with someone that um, uh, is a real, is a real food okay. addict. And yeah. so there's a big difference. Okay. This is you. Uh huh. 
And this oh, is. Wow. It's like an explosion of. <laughs> yeah. So it's all over. So it's a big difference. <clears throat> Like you, she also shows yeah. reward activation, but it's much bigger. But There's spread a lot out. more okay. activation. That's impressive. But you, when you say food addiction, you say to you that exists. It definitely exists, yeah. With brain imaging, you can't really hide it. I yeah. mean, if someone gets a chocolate milkshake, your brain just lights up. Yeah. So it's a, a lot more objective mm -hmm. compared to a questionnaire, for example. If sugar activates the brain's reward zones just like a drug, then it stands to reason that one could develop an addiction to sugar. First you consume a bit of the substance, then you abuse the substance, and one day you can't live without it. get together in support groups. This eating disorder group is called Overeaters Anonymous. Hi, I'm Marie, former compulsive eater. I'm new to the program, but I've been abstaining for 41 days. I eat three balanced, moderately sized meals, and I don't eat in between. It isn't always easy, but it is a new life for me. Lots of emotions rise to the surface, a lot of sadness, because I think that food calmed me down quite a bit. The snacking calmed me down. Today, I've eliminated all that, and I have had to accept to go through some tough times. Sometimes I miss food, certain foods, and I obsess about sweets. What I wanted to say is that I can't stay clean. I eat even if I'm not hungry, just because it's in front of me, because I can, because someone in a shop offers me a taste. And I get such pleasure out of it. This may sound incredible, but I prefer eating to sex. People say to me, eat an apple. I'm sorry, but I have absolutely no desire to eat an apple. I want a sugar high. I want something that gives me a boost because I can't live without it. Thanks for listening. If we can all potentially become addicted to food, how should we feel about the manufacturers of all this processed food? It's time for an appointment with the French addiction specialist, Dr. William Lowenstein. The goal of those who work in the food industry is to sell, not to save humanity. Of course. This industry has figured out exactly what pushes us to go from moderate consumption to abuse, and finally, to addiction. Yes, there are certain substances that we can wonder about from this perspective, such as sugar, salt, fatty acids. Those substances that are more addictive than others. These industrials, just like drug dealers, need to develop customer loyalty. So yes, they focus on salt, sugar, fatty acids, even colors to hook their customers, who we see as patients. Do food manufacturers know that sugar is addictive? Are they junk food dealers? Do they scheme to push us to buy more and more of their products? Remy would have liked to have asked them directly, but none of them accepted his request for a meeting. However, due to alternative communications priorities, unfortunately, we will not be able to grant your request for a filmed interview. Nestlé, but also Kraft, Unilever and Danone, each group would rather refrain from commenting. What the hell are they hiding? 
This silence is not only appalling, more importantly, it is harmful to us because this is a public health issue we're talking about. One point four billion human beings are overweight. That number is higher than world hunger. There are now five million obese people walking this planet, a figure that has doubled over one generation. These excess pounds are the cause of many illnesses, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The problem is so serious and widespread that the United Nations has begun to get involved. In Geneva, at the United Nations Human Rights Council, Remy is meeting with Olivier de Schutter, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Mr. de Schutter's job is to make countries aware of this public health issue. Your Excellency, today I'm calling upon each nation's sense of responsibility. We can no longer allow ourselves to be satisfied by the food industry's empty declarations. A systemic problem requires systemic solutions. But the solutions are slow in coming. Our goal is to mobilize governments on this issue. I believe that no government will act until public opinion expresses impatience and protests against the lack of governmental action in fighting this plague to modern society. Diabetes, cancer and cardiovascular disease weigh heavily on national budgets, particularly in light of the increasing number of victims of these illnesses. My role is to counteract the pressure exerted by the food industry to maintain the status quo. The fight against obesity and excess weight must become a political issue, just like climate change did a few years back. What policy should be implemented to fight against obesity? Governments are slow to impose regulations on the industry. Simple and efficient systems to inform consumers do in fact exist, but the food industry refuses to set them up. Hi, Remy Burkle. Monique Goyen, nice to meet you. Welcome to the book. Monique Goyen, Director General of the European Consumers Union, has been fighting to get Brussels to require traffic light symbols on all food packaging. Monique, can you explain the traffic light idea to us, please? It works like traffic lights in the street. A red light means stop, this contains lots of sugar. The green light means this is OK to eat. And the orange light indicates that the product has a high fat content. Unfortunately, the system applied by the European legislator is not this one. He implemented a much more complicated one that is difficult to understand for the consumer and not very visible on the packaging. But why did the Euro deputies vote against your proposed system? They were under an enormous amount of pressure from the food industry. An armada of consultants invaded the European Parliament. The issue was over lobbied. Certain Euro deputies even complained. There was huge pressure, and threats of job cuts and delocalization were used as leverage. Some say that 1 billion euros was spent on counter research to block the adoption of a traffic light warning system, whereas this is the one that would orient the consumer towards healthier food options. I thought this system was in use elsewhere. Yes, it is used voluntarily in Germany, and it exists in Spain and Portugal. So all in all, certain supermarkets that value their customers consider this warning system useful and have decided to adopt it on their own. So why isn't it applied throughout Europe? Yes, why is that? Do you have the answer? I think that the food industry is afraid of change. It is scared that a system will be forced upon it and that the consumer will begin to understand what he is eating. Votre corps est une planète fragile. Son équilibre peut être menacé. Il faut le protéger. It's not so easy to properly inform the consumer. Manufacturers prefer to emphasize aspects of their products that are beneficial to our health. 
Des études ont montré que bio aide à réguler le système digestif. Les nouveaux BN sont aux céréales complètes, donc ça donne de l'énergie. Le geste qui aide votre corps à être plus fort. But apparently many of these advertising slogans are just for show. So the food industry spends a lot of money on advertising that claims their products are good for your health. Are these claims true? Some are, some are not. What is sure is that there are way too many that are not founded. But the products are still on the market. The consumer is therefore misled into believing certain things about a product's features. In fact, the European Commission has started to clean up these product claims. Out of 2,000 requests for health-related product claims, 80% were rejected. Those manufacturers will have to remove all the packaging and advertising featuring these claims. Let me give you some examples of claims deemed unfounded. As of December, taurine can no longer be featured as an ingredient that improves your physical and mental ability. Green tea will no longer claim to reduce blood pressure, and royal jelly will not pretend to reinforce the immune system. Gelée royale renforce votre système immunitaire. Avec Nutella, ils vont refaire le monde. Et pour refaire le monde, il leur faut un petit déjeuner idéal. Deux tartines de Nutella, c'est le bienfait des noisettes. Et avec un bol de lait et un jus d'orange, c'est tout à fait équilibré pour un petit déjeuner idéal. Nutella. Chaque in the United States, where the food industry lies, it finds itself in a court of law. I thought it was at least as nutritious as peanut butter, maybe a little bit more, and that was just the impression I got from um, the commercial. I thought it had some health benefits. It, it clearly doesn't. In 2012, Ferrero was found guilty of false advertising and had to pay $3 million in damages to Nutella consumers. In France, we're not accustomed to these kinds of lawsuits. Remy is going to interview William Borden, a corporate lawyer. Do you think that over the next decade we will see lawsuits against food industrial groups in France? Each person, each consumer is in theory free to decide what he consumes, in what way and how often. However, it does seem plausible that these industrials might one day face legal action in the event that they have knowingly concealed from the consumer the intentional presence of certain ingredients in their products that are known to generate addictive behavior. We contacted them several times, in France, in the United States and in the Netherlands. No one accepted to meet us. The stakes are high. The more these companies communicate on their virtues, the better they become at perfecting dissimulation strategies it will become practically impossible to identify and access proof. No lawsuits have yet been filed, and the problem of obesity continues to progress. The cost to society is increasing. Jacques Lelearne, Director of Risk Management at the National Health Insurance Bureau for the Sartre region, spends his days analyzing this problem. What we're seeing today in France is a major increase in chronic diseases. 16 million people are affected in France. 7 million have high blood pressure. 2 million are diabetic. Obesity and excess weight is exploding. 33% of the population is overweight. 18% is clinically obese. These conditions are the preamble to all chronic disease. What does LTI mean? Long-term illness. This is both an economic and a public health issue. The cost to insure the average person like you or me is roughly 1,000 euros a year. This includes normal health expenses and treatments, checkups, eyes, teeth, etc. The average long-term illness person costs over 7,000 euros a year. If that segment of the population continues to increase geometrically, at some point we will only be able to reimburse treatment for people with long-term illness at the expense of all others. In France, excess weight and obesity could cost our national health system 10 billion euros per year. In the United States, this plague cost $147 billion in 2008 alone. What can be done? This 
issue must take on a political nature. That is what is happening right now in America. In fact, the First Lady herself has taken on the task. Her Let's Move program is disturbing the obvious. Reintroduce gym class in schools and vegetables in the cafeteria menus. Michelle Obama's goal is to eradicate this problem within one generation, in a country where one out of three adults is obese. In Europe, some countries have adopted more radical methods. Remy is meeting with Christelle Schaldemoos, a Euro deputy from Denmark. For the past two years, her country has been taxing everything that contains too much sugar or fat. Do you think the tax is efficient to um, actually tackle the problems of obesity and bad eating habits? I believe in using economic tools to change behavior, uh, but maybe we could do it in another way than we did it in Denmark. But, but I believe that unhealthy products should be more expensive and healthy products should be uh, less expensive. I believe in using these kind of tools, but it must never ever stand alone. We need to use other tools as well in order to help uh, the citizens to become more healthy. How did the big agro companies respond to this tax? Did they like it, not like it? And what did they do? They hated it, <laughs> definitely. They were not happy at all. <laughs> of course, they were against. Why didn't the agro companies like this tax? First of all, they would earn less money uh, because we are in a situation uh, with a crisis and they feared that this tax would uh, have the impact that the people will, would buy less uh, fatty products. And of course, that was one of the things we wanted to because of the health issue, but they feared loss of uh, income. Mm, they but don't like involvement. They don't like government involvement. No, they, they, want, they want this to be voluntary and they want it to, to be over uh, many years to, to implement a new kind of tax if we should have it at all. In France, a tax was also introduced, but only on sugary beverages. It will generate 240 million euros for the state. The food industry does not like the taste of this. But it remains up to them, first and foremost, to step up to the plate and balance out the contents of our food. Have you ever heard of a woman named Ellie Krieger, a chef? No, I don't know. No? You don't watch, you don't watch the Food Network? No. <laughs> Here in this outdoor market in New York on a lovely autumn day, Remy is meeting with Ellie Krieger, who hosts a program on the Food Network. Good morning, Ellie. Hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? How good. can you get oh, oh, hello. Get the French way. There you go. In her opinion, there is only one thing that can make the industry move. Have you been involved? I mean, do you think the big food companies, do you think they are actually going in that direction or they're just doing it for cosmetic reasons, publicity reasons, which is what's happening in France? Frankly, the bottom line is the dollar, right? It's money. So if they're making money selling healthy products, they're going to make more healthy products. If they're not making money selling healthy products, they're not going to sell more healthy products. It's quite simple in that regard, I think. And so it's our responsibility with our dollar to vote with that dollar. Okay on that one end. On the other end, we need to make healthy food accessible. So rather than letting big, um, big ag and big business dominate the food scene. To round up this investigative report, Remy wants to interview Joan Gusso one of the first nutritionists to have sounded the alarm over 40 years ago. At over 80 years old, Joan continues to grow her own vegetables 30 miles outside of New York and to warn us about the failings of our food system. There were 800 items in the supermarket when I was born. I mean, there wasn't this. It all came after World War II. And uh, all this 
pr proliferation of products. I was just horrified. You know, all those breakfast cereals with marshmallows and stuff in them, all that crap. There was just so much stuff that that was not food as far as I was concerned. And I remember talking about the fact that here we were selling, we were selling to children a diet which we knew we would have to tell adults not to eat. So why were we doing that? And of course, those are the children that are now the adults that are now having diabetes and heart disease and all this stuff and obesity. As a result of that, I mean, what did, what did we think was gonna happen, you know? How do you demonize the big food companies? Because they're only out to make profits. They don't really care about your health and they're not your doctor. They're saying it's your personal responsibility to control yourself. How do you feel about that? Well, this is, this is the, this is the dilemma we've created by creating a society in which we say, quote, free choice is the most important thing. And of course, what we've done is create a society in which people really don't have free choice at all. I mean, it's not free choice to have 60,000 items in the supermarket to choose among. That's not free choice. Because free choice implies uh, full information. To be effective at all, you have to be quite radical. You have to say, don't buy it at all. Don't, don't shop around the edges of the store. That is quite radical, considering it is hard to fill your refrigerator without going to a supermarket. But faced with these multiplying health problems, we can regain control over what is in our plates. We can force the food industry to reformulate its products and not simply wait for legislation to be adopted. I tried to kick the junk food habit to stop eating hamburgers. So now I'm eating these things. Just touching these vegetables makes you feel healthier. You can also do it because it tastes good. It's that simple. Thank you.